Um, so our next panel, I, um, when we started talking about this, we, I, I wasn't aware of any actual funds in the region, and very quickly I heard Lafayette General has a fund. Lafayette General has a fund, really? Um, and then I heard CN's name, and so I, I put a call into CN, and I know his wife. Um, his wife is a very dynamic leader. She runs our community college here, and had an um, electric conversation with CN. And so I wanted them to come and talk about what it looks like in Lafayette. We have a fund already in place um, with project targets and with everything that, that we really need. They are running maybe faster than us. Uh, <laughs> You know, um, and so I, I didn't want it to be some program way out there in Washington, D.C. or in Denver or in Orlando. I wanted to have a tangible example of, of what, how we do it here and how, how it can be done well. And so I asked them to come present. And so today we have David Calicod, um, who is the CEO and president of Lafayette General Health. I'll take both those titles, yeah. Okay. Um, and C.N. Robinson, who is his financial guy. I'm going to give him that title because he has a big, long title. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to let them take it from here and tell you about what they're doing. Well, excellent. Uh, it's great to be with you uh, here today. And, uh, and I just want to be, be clear. Uh, I do serve as president of the company, but today I'm just the setup guy for C.N. Robinson, who's really been running with this. Uh, as in his role as executive director of our innovation fund and also our, our real estate ventures within the health system. It is true that Lafayette General uh, is moving quickly with this and as we're moving quickly in a number of areas. We say in healthcare right now, if you're not transformer quicker than the other guy, uh, you're falling behind because healthcare right now is rapidly evolving uh, as an industry. And so one of the ways that we are uh, trying to move forward is to uh, really approach innovation in a way that other health systems perhaps have not done in the past, certainly not other health systems in the state of Louisiana. And then also uh, what we're doing with real estate and our real estate investment fund and taking advantage of this uh, opportunity zone uh, structure is something that I think is going to be great for Lafayette General. I'm going to do a little plug and get you kind of a level set uh, before I turn it over to CN. Uh, but I did want to, uh, who's going to talk about specifics about what we're doing, but I wanted to give you a little bit more background about Lafayette General. You may not know uh, sort of who we are today versus where we were uh, maybe 10 years ago, uh, but we've changed uh, significantly over time. Um, this past year, um, there were uh, 150 hospital systems in the, in the country named Best Places to Work. Um, Lafayette General Health System had four of those 150. Uh, there were only six in the state, so we had, we had four of the six in the state of Louisiana recognized for that. Um, a couple months ago, we were recognized and went through the uh, certification process to become a level two trauma center. We had functioned as that for many years, but actually went through the survey uh, with the, um, uh, the surveying organization and were able to uh, achieve that. And then finally, uh, just, uh, just this past week, um, we achieved the highest recognition you can in, in, uh, as it relates to the use of electronic health records in f physician clinics, ambulatory clinics, um, as well as uh, at our critical access hospital in St. Martin, where we became the first HIMSS Level 7 certified organization uh, in the state of Louisiana for physician clinics as well as for a critical access hospital. So we try to push the envelope as much, much as we possibly can. Um, I wanted to share with you a few uh, statistics. That's my clicker move, by the way, because I can't see the screens. Um, so uh, Lafayette General uh, does have the, uh, by far, uh, the busiest OB program uh, in Acadiana. Uh, this year we, uh, we surpassed 3,200 deliveries uh, in, uh, in Acadiana. Um, we have uh, almost 4,300 employees uh, system-wide. Uh, when you think about that, from the basin to the Texas border, we are by far the largest employer, private employer, uh, in this entire region. Uh, and so when we add our partner hospitals, uh, we actually have over 6,000 employees within, uh, within Lafayette General Health and our, uh, our affiliates. Um, this past year, uh, also, we had 195,000 emergency room visits um, as a system, so the majority of care being delivered across the region uh, through uh, emergency departments is happening at Lafayette General. Uh, and our footprint uh, really makes us uh, the one system that truly is 
uh, one Acadiana, uh, and that's a shout out to you, Troy, uh, the, the one truly uh, Acadiana uh, provider of health care because we have relationships that are significant regionally. As we look at the, uh, as we look at the map, um, you can see our relationships that we have throughout the region. Um, those of you who have been around uh, for, for a while, uh, 10 years ago, we only had two dots on this map. Uh, and so in the last decade, uh, we have grown uh, from two facilities to seven that we own, a couple others that we manage, and then several others that are clinical affiliates. But we truly have significant relationships uh, with all of the, the major uh, health systems or hospitals uh, in the contiguous um, and surrounding parishes uh, around Lafayette Parish. Um, Lafayette General Medical Center itself, which is the entity that, that falls within uh, the Opportunity Zone that we're going to be discussing um, is by far the largest hospital, uh, again, from the Texas border to the Atchafalaya Basin and sort of up to uh, North Louisiana. We are by far the largest facility uh, located right in the oil center. We're a community-owned, not-for-profit hospital, uh, 501c3. Uh, that affords us uh, a tax status that makes it very attractive as well. Uh, for partnering uh, in this regard. Um, we are uh, by far, as I said before, the largest full service acute uh, care medical center in Acadiana. And just within uh, the oil center, uh, we have uh, 2,100 employees. When you add our physician clinics, our partner uh, clinics, uh, each and every day, uh, over 3,500 employees are entering the oil center uh, to be part of the activities that are going on uh, providing care to the patients throughout, uh, throughout all of Southwest uh, Louisiana. The main campus uh, also has uh, 451 beds, uh, and we provided um, 94,000 emergency department visits um, this past year uh, at Lafayette General Medical Center. And so we, we by far, again, you know, you hear the same, the same message. Uh, what's happening in the oil center is by far the busiest activity uh, in this entire west, southwestern part of the state of Louisiana is happening right there within the oil center. And, and that is important for a number of reasons. One, I think the oil center, uh, quite frankly, um, was the, uh, uh, the original opportunity for a river ranch. We just didn't have uh, as much uh, residential housing. I mean, there is retail located there. Uh, there is uh, restaurants, there are all types of, of businesses, plus you have a huge healthcare enterprise. Uh, and really what we needed was to add sort of additional residential uh, opportunities. Uh, but it's walkable, it's safe. And when you look around the country and you look at hospitals our size and providing the complexity of care that we do, the high acuity care, there are very few places in the country that are blessed with a neighborhood and a surrounding area from the large flagship hospital uh, that is like the oil center. And I think because of that, uh, it presents us with huge opportunities uh, for development of, um, of entities and partners uh, within the oil center that will support the activity that we have there. Um, uh, the um, organization functions using uh, strategic business objectives. And so every year we update our one to three-year strategic business objectives, and, and I'm not going to go through each one of those pillars because then CN will not have any time. Uh, but the final pillar is the important one for today. I, I would say that very few health systems in the country have, as one of their pillars, real estate, uh, but we do because we feel it is such an important part of our move uh, into the future uh, and our, all part of our future growth strategies uh, and our ability to really build on our real estate investment fund that we've put together through our foundation and also uh, take advantage and, and participate in the, uh, the wonderful Opportunity Zone. So as we look at that at last item, that purple item, um, you know, we're working uh, to uh, really establish uh, the real estate needs within the oil center for us as we look at new programs uh, and, uh, and, and new uh, centers of excellence. Uh, and I'm going to talk about those as CN kind of runs through um, our look at, at developing the oil center. So with that, 
Um, I, um, uh, you know, CN uh, is, uh, is a, a professional uh, and has brought so much to our organization. Uh, and, and I dare say that he, uh, you know, his, his wife's pretty sharp, but I think he's pretty sharp too. Uh, so CN, I turn it over to you, buddy. I appreciate that, David. Thank you. Um, so uh, before I get started, uh, you, you heard the, the information that David uh, talked about, which is the growth that we have, right? And that growth, um, you try to do as much of that growth through your own balance sheet. But sometimes there are objectives that you want to seek, go after, obtain, uh, that you need access to growth capital. And so working um, with our phenomenal board of directors and our leaders and our senior executives, we were able to come up with a couple of ideas on how to form funds that allow us to invest in companies and invest in real estate. And then once I go over that, you'll understand why when the Opportunity Zone Fund or the Opportunity Zone Program was put together, it made a lot of sense for us to immediately start and embark upon uh, forming a fund. Um, so uh, <clears throat> we have two healthcare innovation funds. Um, let's, let's first start with, we're Acadiana and we regularly outkick our coverage and punch above our weight every single time. And these are the other systems in the United States who have healthcare innovation funds. I would dare to say, I think we're in pretty good company, David, right? You ha when we fir first formed our first innovation fund four years ago, this is where we had to go look to see who was doing what. The other thing you need to know is not only are we seeing billions of dollars potentially moving into opportunity zones and opportunity zone funds, but I would submit to you that we're seeing one of the greatest movements in equity and wealth into a single sector of our economy, and that is healthcare. The amount of private equity that is entering our space is mind-boggling. Just from the standpoint, if you sit there and think Amazon and Berkshire Hathaway and J.P. Morgan Chase have formed a company, and they alone have a half a trillion dollars in cash on their balance sheet. Now, not half a trillion dollar balance sheets, but cash on their balance sheets with which to do things, and they've said, we're going to fix healthcare. This is why we had to sit back and say, okay, either they're going to do it for us or we're going to do it for ourselves. And again, as Acadians, we like to do things for ourselves. Um, so if you look at uh, this slide, the first fund was a $3 million fund. We invested in five companies, four from Louisiana. Uh, two in New Orleans, um, one here in Lafayette, one in Baton Rouge, uh, and then we had a California company that we brought on board. Um, and I'll go over those companies here in a second. With that California company successfully exiting the fund uh, a few weeks back. So we're very happy. And what that did was it proved to us that the fund worked, that you can make investment in company and see a reasonable rate of return on that investment. I think you also have to understand that we just don't go out and invest we become that company's partner and we open ourselves up and become that sandbox for them to perfect whatever product or service they're offering. And so as we put them through the due diligence process, we make sure we have internal subject matter experts review these companies. And then what we do is we then become their partner. Um, fund two is gonna continue the fund work of fund one. Uh, and the fund is gonna be targeted to be a $10 million fund. We have verbal commitments currently of somewhere between five and $6 million for that fund and we will start investing when we hit five million dollars. So we hope to close out uh, the initial five or six by the end of this calendar quarter with the fund closing for investment uh, at the end of the year. And again, and what we do is we provide seed capital and, 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 and growth capital to companies that are seeking uh, to enter our space. Uh, I think that this bullet is very important, specifically as you heard from the Opportunity Zone Fund discussion earlier. OZFs, are equity investment vehicles. But it doesn't mean they can't ride alongside debt. And so what we do very often is we look at these companies and if they're so early that sort of trying to figure out a company valuation is like wetting your finger and sticking it away and going, okay, let's figure out what their valuation is, we come in with debt instead of equity. And so what we're able to do is structure a debt vehicle and if they move through that debt vehicle and do well, we can use the OZF or our Health Innovation Fund to come along with an equity investment as well. So it's important to know that you can combine both equity and debt structures together to be able to invest in companies, uh, in this instance with Health Innovation Fund, as well as real estate. Um, and so uh, 
I've already talked about the, the next few bullets, but um, it, we're very excited because this gives us the opportunity to invest in solutions that the healthcare system doesn't necessarily have itself. And so what happens is I go to David and the senior executives and I say, what are your pain points? And then we go out to the marketplace and we figure out what in the marketplace is going on and try to find solutions to solve those pain points. Uh, and very briefly, this is the, the process map that we use. Uh, and on the full right hand side, and you, I'm not going to go over all that. You're very good at, I'm assuming, good at reading at this point in time. Um, but on the right hand side are the companies we invested in. So Compliance Partners, Sierra Group, RD Note, Shareport, and Health Loop. Health Loop is the company that, could, that recently invested. They were bought by the GetWell Network. And so the thing I'm allowed to say now that we've finished that transaction is we went from owning a little bit below 6% of a $25 million company to owning a little bit before below 2% of a $200 million company. And so we were quite happy with the way that that investment panned out. But most importantly, we have uh, solidified and they, develop, they deliver patient engagement strategies for us. They're patient engagement technology. And we've solidified our, our, uh, our platform around patient engagement. So if you come to the hospital, you're going to get a loop sent your way. And it's going to be either an email and soon to be a text message that's, that engages you in your health care. Uh, and that's very important because one of the things we're seeing in the healthcare environment is the move to, co to consumerization, right? So the joke I think, David, you told the other day is people, who, people who are consumers are upright and people who are patients are not. Is the, is the general way we look at it. And so we have to engage both folks. And I would just add the only, the only, the one thing we knew also is that the only patients we're guaranteed in the future are the ones that are horizontal. You know, the people that are vertical have choice and they're consumers. So I, I will just say a health loop uh, re, sort of reaffirmed to us that the return on investment in this innovation fund is much higher than healthcare, by the way. Uh, but more importantly, uh, it is improving care. It's reducing readmissions, it's reducing complications, and, and it's really enhancing the patient experience. And as a community-owned, non-for-profit health system, everybody thinks, wow, they're Lafayette General, there's hundreds of millions of dollars flowing through them. And in a good year, our margins are somewhere between 1% and 3%. Anybody want to operate their business on 1% to 3% margins and on rates that you can't set yourself? No? No? Okay. No takers. No, no takers. So uh, now you understand why we need to have access to this growth capital because 1% to 3% margins essentially gets us those things that we absolutely need. Most importantly, how we, uh, we reward our, our, our employees, right, and make sure that they're engaged in what we're doing, uh, but doesn't leave a lot of growth capital available. And so the second, uh, the third fund that we have is the real estate investment fund. Um, and remember, these are targeted for returns. These are structures that allow a community-owned non-for-profit to go out and seek capital for reasonable rates of return for the investors, right? This isn't a donation to the foundation, although if you want to donate a million dollars to the foundation, we'd be happy to. Happy to. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a reasonable rate of return to these investors, both in the Health Innovation Fund and investing in companies that we become a part of our sandbox, as well as in our real estate. And so... Um, what we do is we structure it so that that investment is also partly a charitable donation or foundation. So you have a dual purpose structure. So you can both invest and receive a reasonable rate of return as well as uh, have a charitable contribution. Um, the properties that we seek are, pri are, are primarily, if not all, healthcare related or ancillary support services. And I'll talk a little bit about that here and what we're going to talk about in terms of the oil centers redevelopment. Um, but the magic occurs in that second bullet point, which is essentially any time we build through the real estate investment fund a property or a building uh, for the health system, the only way we do it is if the health system agrees to 100% lease it from the fund, which means you have one payer, right? One. And so essentially we're using the health system's balance sheet to guarantee that investment. Uh, and I don't think really you'll find that very often in other funds that you get into. And remember, we're, we're, we're a REIF, a real estate investment fund, not a REIT, which is a publicly traded trust of some sorts, okay? And so that's the power of this. You can invest in our real estate investment fund, the health system guarantees that lease, 
and you receive then as an investor your, your, your appropriately sized uh, return on investment, right? Okay. And then, again, this is the flow chart. I won't go uh, into each and every one of them. It took us three years of, of working with a firm out of Chicago, working with a firm in New Orleans, to perfect this structure. And so we had done a lot of work to get this in place, and then all of a sudden, the Opportunity Zone program showed up. And we sort of sat back and went, holy smokes, this is a great way to use our real estate investment fund and our health innovation funds alongside an Opportunity Zone fund. And so essentially what we call it is we call it, we twin the funds. So if we are investing in a property in the oil center and somebody has just, you know, they have free, free cash to, or a dry powder to use to go and make that investment, we could put them in the reef. But say they have a capital gain that they need to mitigate, we put them in the oil, oil center or we put them in the opportunity zone fund. And then those two come together to invest that equity in that property. And so... I'm glad you cleaned up the word you used for TV. <laughs> <laughs> Um, David uh, regularly tells me I have to dial my jersey back because I'm from New, uh, from New Jersey is where I grew up. And so I am, I'm constantly editing, like in my head, right? Um, <laughs> uh, so um, our major project that we're looking at uh, working on is the redevelopment of Hospital Drive. Does, how many people know where Hospital Drive is uh, on, in the oil center? If you don't, you go down Coolidge and it's the first left you can make to head back towards Gerard Park. And so we're really looking at that entire right-hand side, if you're thinking about Hospital Drive, of redeveloping that. And it's going to be a, a, a really kind of a neat redevelopment. It's going to be both a three- to five-story MOB. But then what folks also don't realize is we are an educational institution. Uh, with our partnership with LSU, we have anywhere from 60 to 70 doctors and training residents here with us, which requires us to house them and so the thought process there is halfway down the block is the MOB, three to five stories, and then the other halfway down the block becomes that type of residential redevelopment towards Gerard Park Boulevard to house our uh, residents. And we spend anywhere from sixty to $70,000 a month uh, on, on housing them here in the community, and so it makes a lot of sense. And David, uh, what, some of the things that we're thinking about with that three to five story MOB. Yeah, so, um, you know, we talk about the growth of the system over the last uh, decade, and um, what, we, uh, what we intend to do is really house two of our, our key service lines, um, bringing in new centers of excellence um, uh, for them and, and really developing new centers for them. So the Cancer Center of Acadiana 10 years ago didn't exist. We didn't have medical oncologists, that, him, him Alex, that were employed. Uh, and since that time, uh, we now have... Um, we're now up to um, 51 physicians that are associated with our cancer center uh, from medical oncology, radiation oncology, um, uh, various surgical uh, services. Um, the, the program has, has just been unbelievable. Uh, in the past uh, three years, um, our cancer program has doubled in size. Uh, and so we're now treating patients from all over southwest Louisiana. And so we're looking at a brand new cancer center of Acadiana uh, to, um, to have a significant amount of space in the new, uh, in the new building. Uh, we also um, have um, really expanded our neuroscience uh, division. And so, again, uh, when we started 10 years ago, we didn't, we didn't really have em employed uh, or a coordinated neurology or, or neuro uh, neuroscience division, and so uh, we're going to have a new neuroscience center of, uh, for Acadiana uh, based there as well. Uh, and so, w when we look at that, um, there are, um, we have 20 uh, providers, um, um, eight physicians, and 12 nurse practitioners involved in our neurology practice, and we. We're in multiple offices now, and so the exciting thing is for both those programs, putting everybody under one roof, uh, and then looking at sort of the pieces that go along uh, that, ne that need to be in the building to support them. Uh, and so uh, we're excited about uh, retail and, and other uh, health-related uh, groups that we would bring into uh, to the development. From a standpoint of training, um, we have uh, uh, we have really sought to be the best place for LSU um, physicians, medical students, to receive their training. Uh, and uh, we, have, we have 
improve the experience in Lafayette, not only at UHC, uh, but also the 20 plus residents that we have at uh, Lafayette General Medical Center. Uh, and our belief is that um, while we think that we already have achieved it in terms of it being a very robust and thorough clinical experience for them, we also want to make sure that their experience in Lafayette is as positive as it possibly can be. Uh, and so creating living space for them that puts them within the wall center, puts them walking distance to the hospital. You know, that's what these young kids want nowadays, Cian. Uh, and, and so we believe that it, it will be that last piece that we really, that, that will make our experience completely different than others. Um, 80, 90% of the physicians, uh, when they get out of training, stay where they trained. I think it's important for this community that they stay here. Uh, and so we're trying to make it uh, as, um, as wonderful an experience for them as we possibly can. We're also looking uh, at a new breast center that we'll be uh, adding. And so again, same story. Um, we, we, had, we didn't really have a program uh, 10 years ago. Now, uh, as of today, we have three um, um, breast uh, imaging uh, physicians, radiologists. Uh, and then also a, uh, a breast surgeon. And so we're going to be looking at a, uh, a very, uh, very nice um, uh, breast center uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the oil center area as well. I think what, what we, you can take away from this is also the fact that we're uh, a little bitty economic engine for the area, right? When you think about the number of employees and bringing these folks in. So we take economic development uh, very seriously because if we don't have these structures in place, we can't do what we need to do. Um, and I think it would be important for you to understand that all of this is done to restore, maintain, and improve health. It's to fulfill our mission, and that's for all Acadians. Uh, so if, if you go to the sort of the final slide, so um, I'd be remiss in also not talking about a success story we had with uh, our first innovation fund, our health innovation fund, and it actually came through a program called Accelerate South. Um, and uh, there was a company that went through that program. I'm not going to name the company because um, we're, we're still working with our partners at LIDA to figure out uh, the details. But um, because we had our Health Innovation Fund, because they had access to our health system, because they had access to a partner of ours, I think you all know them, they're called Acadian Ambulance and Acadian Companies, um, they are choosing to consider Lafayette for the relocation of their company uh, and their global corporate headquarters. OPS, they're gonna be in the oil center in the opportunity zone. And so that became a strong economic tool. So we are able to make an investment in them through the Health Innovation Fund, and they should they prove out their metal and their worth, we follow it on with another investment of, of, of a larger size where we can either use the Health Innovation Fund again or the equity that's in the Opportunity Zone Fund to help them continue their growth and their, their strategy or their strategic climb. Um, really, uh, I don't know if they're excited, but I'm excited, CNC. <laughs> they, they are excited. They're coming to, oh gosh. They can't, they can't, they're coming to town this evening, so today's a long day. It's a, it's I, meant, a, I actually meant the audience. Oh, <laughs> they, you know what, David? It's kind of like teaching at UL sometimes. You stare at the students' faces and you're not quite sure if they're learning anything or you're this, just talking. This or... is a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and again, I, I think what you, you get this, uh, the, the gist of it, which is, you know, um, we have a, a, a project that's ready. And so for those of you con, uh, considering putting together your own, you're in an opportunity zone, you're considering putting your own fund together, having those projects ready to go is extremely important. Putting that prospectus together is extremely important. Don't just think real estate. Think economic development and company uh, ret retention and attraction. Um, and then uh, make sure you understand what other programs you have. I know our, our friends at, at LIDA and LED, we work with them, and specifically with this company, we're, we're seeing if there's twinning opportunities on other incentives that are out there. Um, we're working uh, currently with the city on trying to figure out if there's uh, different district overlays that we can have for the oil center. Maybe there's a historic overlay that we can think about because then you can bring historic tax credits, new market tax credits. There's all kinds of other different opportunities to twin and to, uh, uh, I would say, exponentially grow that opportunity. So with that, I turn it back over to you all. If there's some questions or how do you want to do this, Ms. Monique? So 
do we have any questions? Um, yes. Hale is coming with the microphone. Your real estate investment trust. Now, that's, that's a uh, opportunity zone fund. No, no, sir. So what we did was the real estate investment fund was formed before the opportunity zones came out. And it was a way to attract capital and receive a reasonable rate of return for okay. investors. All right. But, uh, okay, so y'all are 501c3. Yes, sir. And you, you, you're buying, you're investing into real estate that's health care related mainly. Yes, sir. And what's y'all's ownership in it? A general partner, developer, or something, or, or how do you blend in, how you marrying opportunity, how would you marry opportunity zones, how you layering it with a 501c3? For so the 501c3, uh, as the health system, is enable, is, is allowed to, and we've gone through the legal structures, and if you want to go back to the slide with uh, sort of the legal, keep going, er, er, whoop, stop, forward, one more, keep going. There you go. So if you look at it, you have the health system and the foundation is a wholly owned subsidiary of the health system. And then what we, we do is we put in a general managing partner, which is that LLC, that first gray square. Uh, and then the next one is the LP. That's the limited partnership that where the money's come into and that go in and make the investment. So that's where you're getting the equity through the real estate investment fund. Now the brilliant thing is, is you can have a similar structure, not as complicated because of we had to make sure we had a blocker corporation, which was the, the general managing partner in place, to make sure that we maintain our 501c3 status and fulfill our mission. Uh, hence, why the foundation is also in there, so that all the money that is, is that does move through that is chair is is considered to be part of our mission and our statement. Um, but you can do something similar with an opportunity zone fund, which is you sit there and you form that fund. It has a, a similar structure, and then what you do is you twin it. You have people who have just dry powder, ready to invest in real estate. You can put that into the wreath. And if you have people who have capital gains mitigation needs, you put it into the OZF. You take the two together, and that becomes the equity play in the property that you're developing. Okay. Other questions? Ask C, and obviously, you know, he's got this very well thought out. And I think this is, um, I don't know, um, a more complex example, probably. Than, uh, than what we see. Um, so it is a high-end example, but they really have a lot of information, so ask, ask some questions. So the OZF itself, I mean, when we go to form it, isn't gonna be as complex as that. It's gonna be an opportunity zone fund, it's gonna have a private placement memorandum get it, it's gonna have an operating agreement, it's gonna be very simple, and that's where we're gonna attract the equity. We had to make sure it was this way because otherwise we look like a REIT, not a reef. Right? It's, we had to go through that re regulatory process. We're not publicly traded. That's the big thing. Well, and I think that's part of the beauty here is that the Opportunity Zone Fund allows a simple slip into a much more complex, oh, well thought right. through plan. Um, you're not just out there on your own in a sing singular investment. So. And make sure that you do seek advice. So we use Laporte as our, our accounting firm on, our, on these projects. We also use Fishman Haygood out of New Orleans, and Megan Reese is the attorney we use there. Uh, she's, she's wonderful to, wor to work with, so we've used both Laporte and Fishman Hago to make sure that we're, we're right with the rain, I guess is the best way to put it. Dan Reese? No relation to Megan. <laughs> um, you mentioned the private placement memorandum. We were chatting over here about the, the, the overall securities law aspect of soliciting investments and how is this not triggering some sort of SEC issue on marketing investors into these in projects? So what we do is SEC has rules that say you have to go after qualified investors. Those qualified investors, if they're married, have to have $300,000 or more in uh, annual income or a, a, a net of a million dollars in assets that are not related to real estate, okay? And so those become qualified investors. The SEC's tried for a long time to figure that problem out, and they essentially said, hey, look, if you're smart enough to earn 300 grand a year and you're smart enough to have a million dollars in assets, you're smart enough to determine if you should invest in something or not. And so that's that. Now, do we have to, this is really technical, do we, once we have somebody sign the PPM, file a Form D with the SEC that they've invested? Absolutely. 
It's pretty simple for me. I just talk to the people he tells me to. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question up here. Are you planning to use any of the Opportunity Zone funds um, for projects for your critical access hospitals? And if so, how does it work to invest in a tax-exempt uh, political subdivision that receives non-operating revenue from millages? Wow. <laughs> Great. Oh, well, awesome question, P.S. You know? So I, uh, I just realized it when I was outside looking at those maps um, in terms of the Opportunity Zones. And yes, there are several that are in our current uh, portfolio of hospitals as well as hospitals that we have relationships with so I, I do think that it, there's some merit for us to really run the traps uh, and figure out that yeah. CN I know has some some initial thoughts but I think it's a wonderful way in which for us to enhance those communities um, and bring needed services our whole point is to make all of our partner hospitals stronger and for as much primary care to be delivered in those communities as possible uh, it's better economically uh, for that local community, and it's better for the patient. Uh, and so I think this is a huge opportunity for us. Uh, Cian? I really think it, we would have to delve into the specific structure that is between the hospital service district and whomever's running that hospital. I know in our instance, many times we lease that building back, and then we're the operating company that comes in. But say there is a need for... Um, a new wing or another building, we would have to very carefully run those traps to make sure that we're not violating any issue, or there's not any issues associated with that. But I do think you can use an OZF uh, in a public-private partnership to help build that building uh, uh, on that piece of property that maybe that HSD owns. You can, you, again, you're thinking of we, you know, and then you're talking the 100-year lease. You're talking how much is that lease worth. You, we need to know what the millages are associated with it. I mean, there's a lot of different pieces, parts that would be involved to run that trap. So that information you would get from Laporte, your company that you work with, or where do you gather that information? So um, we, get a, we, we get a lot of good advice from Laporte and our attorneys uh, on working through that. But then also it's your relationship with your HSD as well. Thank you. Great question. Um, you're not one of the first that has said, you know, you kind of have to, it, it, the program is sort of focusing on real estate, but you can get outside of that as well. And I'm, I'm so I looked in the prospectus and it refers to uh, opportunity, invest, uh, opportunity fund investments being businesses, real estate, and business assets. So what would qualify as a business asset? Have they gotten that far on, on these definitions? I mean, is it, in, in your case, you got it. You got it. Yeah. medical equipment? Yes, vehicles? so say we okay. needed to go buy a, we want, say instead of leasing the MRI, we wanted to buy a brand new one and it's $30 million. That'd be an expensive MRI, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> MRIs? Am I like totally off the, <laughs> like, am I totally off the, okay. Um, I'm apparently completely off on the cost of MRIs. Um, <laughs> like way out in front of your skis there. Like I'm, like I'm over my skis and tumbling. Okay, perfect. Okay. Which isn't the first time. Let's right? say $3 million. All right. You can use an OZF to go and invest in that asset, absolutely. But again, you're looking at, use, you're going to have to have a reasonable rate of return on whatever that looks like. And you have to put the structure in place. So my guess is you're forming an LLC that would go buy the MRI. You know, just very simple. And then you would get the OZF to invest in the LLC, issue units. Where you go. I would add this too. From a community development perspective, from the towns, think about the facilities that you can identify that stream of revenue is what it is, so that you can partner with that. But yeah, where there's a stream of revenue, that's where it makes sense. Yes, ma'am. Right? Yes. And there would be definitely a stream of revenue with an MRI that's not $30 million. <laughs> what other questions? And I would be remiss in not thanking um, Ms. Monique and her team in putting this together and the FDIC and the Office of the Controller of Currency for sponsoring it. Also, uh, Joel and uh, his team, uh, specifically Danielle Bro, um, walking us through a, a bunch of different things. Uh, Manny Mitchell, LED, who you're going to hear from in a, in a little bit. Uh, and then uh, representative from uh, House District 44, uh, Vincent Pierre. Um, all of those folks worked very diligently to get us our our census tracts designated and put in place. And so uh, without their, their work, we would not be able to have this conversation with you. 
So thank you to all of them. And, and we certainly, uh, with uh, Representative Pierre, who's one of my favorite people, I mean, we, we uh, the opportunity uh, to be a part of this uh, came late in the process, and so we, really he and Joel both did a great job getting us in there. Um, we're committed to, um, certainly as CN said, restoring, maintaining, and improving the health of our entire region, uh, and, and we do that in many ways. Um, uh, I would assure you that um, I believe this uh, program is going to have profound impact on our region. Uh, we, uh, we're moving quickly with this, and we certainly are willing and able, and, and we'll provide any, any feedback or follow-up that you might have, because uh, we want this to be successful in all the communities uh, throughout Acadiana, and it's a pleasure being here today. Thank you. Thank you both, really. Um, thank you for sharing and being so open with it all. Uh,